it's time for me to, to release these stories and like let them go and disidentify myself with these stories. Mm. Welcome to fatherhood, breaking the toxic cycle. Dive in as real dads bear all the mess ups, make ups, and every heartfelt moment in between. Tune in. It's raw, it's real, and it might just change the way you see family. Welcome to another episode of fatherhood, breaking the toxic cycle. Now I'm excited and privileged to have uh, one of my uh, new friends and brothers that I've uh, just met over the last year and uh, excited for him to share his story of just uh, his upbringing and challenges that he faced and what he's done to start the process of not only healing little Javon, but also his story. So welcome. Thank you for uh, coming on today. Thank you. Glad and to I be here. I love the fact that you brought the Bible with you. So that was beautiful because I had a chance to open it up and just see a message that came and the message just talked about, no, there will be no famine. There will be no, um, no sword, no sword. There's peace. Yeah. And that was beautiful, especially as we're kicking off uh, today's episode. Yeah. And so it, it's, it's, it was fitting for the moment that we are here to talk about how we heal our relationships. Um, well, with their you don't know how fitting it was because for me, I am learning how to demand self-respect. Mm. And so I've been coming at uh, all of my relationships almost in an adversarial way. And so when you pulled that scripture out, I knew that was God saying, you can put your sword down. Wow. <laughs> you can, mm. There will be peace. That's Beautiful. Yeah. So why don't we start from the beginning and let's talk about Little Javon and your upbringing and just where you grew up at and, um, you know, if you were in a single parent household or mother and father and just what the story looks like. Okay. So, yeah, as a young child, I grew up in a single parent household and uh, father was never really around, you know, it's the old cliche story, but um, I, it was me and my, my boys that raised each other um it was like six or seven of us in this little neighborhood you know all little black boys none of us have fathers except mm -hmm. one and so we raised each other but we didn't know what we were doing obviously you know so we're all sharing these beliefs and these values together and we created our own culture and it was very competitive and it was filled with lust obviously little teenage boys right <laughs> and so I took that with me all the way up until until my adulthood. And wow. so I'm still, you know, living life, you know, married and as a grown man, still living life full of lust and still very competitive and egoic and prideful. And these are things that I, I thought was just going to be a part of me for the rest of my life. Didn't really see a problem with it until I started running into issues. So let me ask you a question. Yeah. So you know, you, you brought up something because that's a very common denominator with all men, lust. Mm -hmm. But even before that, where did you grow up at? What city and state? I was in Roland Heights, Roland Heights, California. Okay, that's Roland Heights. Up. And you said something that really resonated because I have a lot of friends, including myself, that we just kind of grew up and we just self-taught each other. So right. that seems to be a common denominator um, that just continues to live on, when, especially when you come from... A single parent household. Yeah, and there's no, there was no mentor to, you know, uh, kind of guide us and say, hey, maybe think, think about, about women this way or that way. So that was never really there. And so, you know, my father was, I want to say in and out, but he wasn't even in and out. There was just this, a few experiences that I had and they were, and none of them were positive, you know. And the very last one was when it's time for me to, to release these stories and like let them go and disidentify myself with these stories. Mm. So this is probably going to be the last time I tell this story. I love that. So as in the fourth grade, I, I was playing baseball. They told us to go knock on doors and sell candy for your uniform. And I did that and I made $21.76 and I was so proud of myself. And I put it on, my, on the refrigerator and the next morning it was gone. He stole it. And he never came back. And it was just, it was heartbreaking. I didn't realize how heartbreaking it was at the time, obviously fourth grade, but just knowing that your father would steal from you. And at a young age, like 
I was so proud of myself. And he just snatched it and never came back. And you were heard I was that heard. your father stole that money from you. It was money that you were using to raise money. Yeah. And took it. Yeah, it never came back. And so that was it. And then as we as I grew and became a father myself and there was there was a time when my uncle passed away and my uncle or my grandmother said, come over, take any of his clothes or shoes that you want of his because we kind of had to share the same size. Apparently, I took the wrong shoes. They were my father's shoes. And so my father calls me and says, bring my shoes back. But this is a man that never gave me five dollars. Hmm. So you would think he'd be like, OK, my son has my shoes. One pair of shoes, it's cool. No, I brought the shoes back. When I brought the shoes back, he asked me for $5. I gave him the $5. But that's the kind of dynamic it was. How like, old were you when that happened? I, you know, I was in my thirties. Okay. In my thirties. So he just, the cycle just repeated itself. Yeah, like still, like you haven't grown at all, Pops. Why was he always trying to suck money out and maybe that's not the proper word but he was always asking always gravitating was it because was there an addiction was it or that's just the way he grew up heroin addict heroin addict and that's how he passed away od 66 years old 2019 now did you grow did you grow up with him or when you were young i grew up with moms with your mom, okay. She she raised us, okay. And my mom never knew about self-respect. She never knew how to demand self-respect. She never. She didn't know a lot of things. She she did her she did the best she could, but she raised us in a way that we missed out on a lot of principles and morals. She raised us in the Word, the Bible. But the faith was never really there. So she was always talking about the Bible, but whenever it came time to pay the bills, I remember her crying, begging, you know, her brother to help us. And um, I kind of noticed that even though there's a lot of words about the Bible and God, the faith was lacking. Now, dive a little bit deeper into the faith. What does that mean? And because when when I hear this, this is what I think. I think about people that pray to the Lord, you know, help me heal from my disease, help me. And they're waiting, waiting, but they don't take action. Yeah. Because, you know, yes, you want to believe, you want to have faith, but you also have to take action. And it seems like when you're just relying on the Lord, not that he doesn't gift us with miracles, but when you always putting pressure on the Lord for answers, you end up disappointed because it's not always him giving the answers. Sometimes it's giving you the knowledge that you need to go out and seek the solution to the problem. Great point. You know, the Bible says faith without actions is dead, right? Mm -hmm. Faith without actions is dead. And, and um, I saw that a lot with my mom where there was there was not a lot of action behind some of the things she would do or say. And um, at this point, I realized she just didn't have much of a backbone. And, um, you know, she would always preach the meek shall inherit the earth. Um, she would always preach about being humble. And um, there's a scripture that, that talks about the poor. It's in that same scripture. The meek shall inherit the earth, the poor she'll inherit the earth, something like that. And she always kind of gravitated to that. She never really had many dreams in life. Her dream was just to become a mother. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what she was. But now, looking back at 44 years of my life, I realized there were still a lot of holes in her parenting. And I'm still cleaning that up to this day and figuring out how to become whole myself. Now, I don't blame her, though, because mm -hmm. I know she did the best she could. So when you say there's a lot of holes and you want to clean them up, do you feel it's your journey and your responsibility to clean them up? 
Absolutely. Okay. It's my journey. It's my life. Okay. And that's why I don't blame her. She did the best she could. But at the same time, I got to I gotta take it from here. <laughs> mm. um, and so I thought she had did a really good job. But every time I got into a relationship, because I believe that, like your relationships are a, a mirror to you and your your weaknesses. And so when I would get into these relationships, they would always point out these flaws in my character that I thought were okay at the time. But now I'm seeing it because seeing a consistent pattern. I'm like, okay, well, it can't, it can't just be that person or that person. Mm. Got to just be what it is. So I, I accept it now and, and um, willing to do the work to become whole. So little Javon grew up. Did you know your dad was addicted to heroin when you were that when you were little? Yeah, I mean, I know what heroin was, but I knew that there was drugs involved. I visit him. Visit. We visited him once in jail, so that was all obviously a bad look. Um, he never paid child support. That was always a bad look, you know, in the house. He just never provided for us. And I guess that made me feel like he never loved us. Now I realize he never really loved us. <laughs> he only loved his drugs. He was very selfish. And I grew up very selfish. And thinking that being selfish was a good thing. Wow. Yeah. And I raised my kids in a very selfish manner. Because I took on this idea from a channeler named Abraham Hicks. Abraham Hicks. She says that it's it's good to be selfish. Um, and the analogy was if you're in a plane and the mask come down, you got to put the mask on you first before you put it on your child. Okay. That makes sense. But if you're living your life in a selfish manner every single day, it's just that's not the way Christ raised us. You know, in, in Philippians 2, 3, it says to esteem others even better than you. To pretty much put others before you. Jesus washed his disciples' feet. Can you imagine washing my feet? Probably not. That's the <laughs> humility. humility. You know, putting, putting others before yourself. And that was something that I never even imagined that I could do. And I'm still learning how to do that. Let me ask you a question because you said something that... I'm feeling like it's a common denominator today with all the guests that we've had on. And all of them had parents that were addicted, um, you know, either mother, father, two drugs, meth, heroin, et cetera. And I'm going to pose this question to you because this came up earlier today. One of the guests said, I resented my father because he chose the drugs over me and he couldn't give them up. And they've lived with that hurt and pain. Do you also resonate with that? That you wanted your daughter to your father to choose you and your siblings over the drugs? Do you have that hurt and animosity as a as a child growing up? I don't know. I don't know. It didn't it didn't really hit me that it was the drugs that was keeping him away. But I do remember being on the football team and my dad calling and saying, I'm gonna be at the game and me looking into the crowd and him never being there. Mm. You know, that's still there. And I don't want to keep telling that story either. Um, now, let me just ask you a question about that. Okay. Because that came up today, too. Uh, and a person that was on the football team, yeah, the dad didn't show up, so he quit. Ooh. Did you I didn't stick quit. it out? Yeah. I stuck okay. It out. So I'm just curious why you stuck it out. Well, one thing my mom raised me at in the manner of finish what you start. And mm -hmm. that's one great thing to see instilled into me uh but i gotta be honest my mom was addicted too okay she was addicted to alcohol and marijuana and that's how i first started smoking marijuana we used to steal it from moms <laughs> in the high school days mm -hmm. we used to steal it from moms and so it took me about 20 years to realize that marijuana is not good for me and then once i finally put it down that's when my 16 year old son picked it up because he had seen me doing it. I guess I still feel guilty about that. I'm trying to release that guilt. But that's the truth. And um, 
Yeah, I, I was just able to just release it one day, which I can't even take credit for. I know that was God. But it was after uh, the bottom, I was at the bottom of the bottom, and I said, something's got to change, and I threw away all my weed. And I had done that five times before and always came back to it. But this last time I did it in um, June of 2021, and I haven't smoked in about two years. Wow. Yeah, and it's something that my family does religiously daily there's only a few of us that's been able to kick it <laughs> and i'm one of them wow. now let me ask you um so you're growing up and then how old were you when your son was born 25 25 okay it's now how many kids do you have two two okay so your son's 25 and then you have um two sons or I have two sons okay and how old's your other son well, my first son is 19. Okay. And then the second son is 16. Okay. Yeah. And then when you were growing up and you're 25, you have your first son, how did that look like when you're still trying to figure things out? You're young and your upbringing wasn't the best. And how do you know how to be a father? How do you know how to love? How do you know how to instill, like, how am I going to be a father? At 25 years old, man, you think you know everything. Mm. <laughs> and I thought I had it all figured out, man. And I felt like God was going to pave the way. Mm. And there weren't going to be any challenges because I got married. So I had this idea that, you know, the Bible preaches, you know, fornication is a sin. So my idea was, okay, well, if I get married, I'm not fornicating. But that never took care of the lust that was running my life. I just tried to put a Band-Aid over it. Mm. Or like my wife says, try and block the sun with your thumb. Mm. <laughs> wow. So I got married thinking that, okay, I figured it out. Now that I'm not sinning, all the blessings are going to come now. <laughs> That's not what happened. Wow. So, um, yeah, I didn't know, man. And my mom and my brother tried to warn me, you're too young, yada, yada. I stepped out on faith and... Um, I don't regret it because it really grew me up. I had to figure it out myself, you know. Another thing my mom always taught me was no excuses. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't asking anyone for any help. I was grinding it out and doing what I had to do to take care of my young family. But um, I was so ill-prepared. Yeah. And so ill-equipped emotionally, wow. most importantly. And I would, I would challenge you to say that even though your mom was ill-equipped in some areas, there were some areas that she was point on. Right. And they stayed with you. Right. Um, i curious, you know, your faith, it's a, it's a strong part of your identity. Where did that come from? Well, it came from my mom, and then I walked away from it. Okay. And I walked away from it during that first marriage. So during that first marriage, I realized that there was corruption and... It just pushed me away. There's corruption in the religion that I was in, and it pushed me away from it. And it, and it caused me to want to read and study and research other things, other religions, other spiritual faiths and thing like that, things like that. And I'm glad I did. Um, but recently, I've come back full force. Or I, I should say, yeah, I came back to God because God was always there. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And when I came back to God, due to my wife, God was like, man, I've been waiting for you. And he wow. just been, he just been pouring into me ever since. It's been a great feeling to be back in the word of God and trusting the word of God. Because for a long time, I stopped trusting the word of God. And I'm going to touch on that and I'm going to go backwards a little bit. But I noticed that you've started posting um, on, your, on your YouTube, just you're spreading the word. So I'm curious to find out, and you said that it came back to you. So what are you looking to do with that? You're, you're now speaking the word, it's coming to you. Um, why? Because God wants to use me. That's it. He wants to use me. He wants to use all of us. And so, you know, he's like, man, I've been waiting for you. And when I feel it, Bubbling in my heart, I know, okay, I got to get this word out. It's not about the results, not about who sees it, who doesn't see it. It's just about God's like, get this out, get this word out. 
And sometimes he'll give it to me in scriptures, like a sequence of scriptures. And then sometimes it'll just come. And that's why I brought the word today because it'll just flow. Okay, so in high school, another thing my mom instilled in me was all the answers you're ever gonna need in life are in this word. Mm. And she gave me a devotional. In that devotional, 365 days, if you read these four chapters every day, you'll get through the Bible in a year. Mm. I did that. Wow. I did that consistently. Read through the Bible four years in a row. I felt like it didn't answer all the questions. Mm -hmm. There were still more questions to be answered. And so I kind of stepped out of that a little angry. Like, where, wait, this don't, don't, it don't address this. It don't address that. It don't address this. So then I started traveling. I went to Dubai, UAE, and I saw how the Muslims prayed. And they were talking. And another guy was studying with in India. I didn't go to India, but he came from India. He was talking about chakras. The Bible didn't talk about chakras and things like that. So that stuff was deep to me. Um, and I was really open to it. But the foundation of the word of God was always there. So when I came back to it, it just like multiplied. It expanded in a bigger way. And that's, that's why I, I feel God saying, I've been waiting for you. Because the foundation is already there. So now let's get to work. Let's get to so work. let me ask for other fathers out there that maybe the Lord's calling them, but they're missing the message. So was it just a feeling inside or what's, how can you interpret that for other people that maybe they're being called, but they don't know that they're being called. They're dismissing it. Was it just, you knew inside a feeling? Was it a revelation yet? What was it that you knew he was calling you back? Well, I would get these scriptures from my wife and these scriptures would resonate with me at, a, at such a deep level that I felt like I, I needed to share it. It's just like a, a bubbling in my heart. That's like a fire. And then I, when I feel that, I'm like, oh, I need to share this. Mm. That's it. And God is just like, just start the conversation. You don't have to know everything. You don't have to be blameless, like my brother says to me now. So, you know, I've been sending scriptures to my family and those that rub, the Bible rubs the wrong way will start to shoot personal insults. Okay, that says a lot about you. <laughs> so, um, but some people feel like, oh, I, my whole life has to be perfect before I can be used by God. Mm. But let's go back into the Bible, the, the biblical history. You guys know Moses was a murderer. You guys know Moses killed no. someone. Before God said, I need you to go spread this word. You guys know Paul, who wrote 66% of the New Testament, killed Christians. Okay. So God used murderers to spread his word. So no, you don't got to be perfect. Just start the conversation. Because you know who's starting the conversation that's winning? The devil. The evil energy. It's everywhere. His conversation is going around. It's, it's easy to talk about evil. On the news, right? Always talking about murder. Anything you want to talk about. But when it, when it comes to Jesus, oh no, we got to be perfect before we talk about God? No. So let's just get the conversation started, okay? At one of my gigs, because I do sing on the weekends, I do a lot of weddings, I just put the Bible on the table one day. And everyone was like, had different energy toward it. Some people were positive, <laughs> some people were negative. They were like, oh, he's the Bible guy. Like, <laughs> Why are we so scared to have a conversation about the Bible? Because there's conviction there. God is not just lovey-dovey, fluffy-duffy. He's like, mm -hmm. and a lot of people have turned it into that. And a lot of this new age religion, oh no, God is just love. Okay, God is love. God is unconditional love. But there is a devil, even if it's not a being there is an evil force out here that we all have experienced that, that we have to fight against. Because the Bible says in John 10.10, 10, the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And I've experienced that. Things that I've created have been destroyed.
And so if we don't push against it, the devil will win. And so that's why Jesus Christ came back to give us this opportunity. Hey guys, this is how we're supposed to be living. Get focused, get focused back on this way of living guys, because there is an enemy. He's real. And for a long time, I didn't feel like the devil was real. Wow. But, so, yeah, you know, we've talked a little bit about lust. Yeah. So now you're an adult, you have your first son, yeah. you're married, you're on the path with, you know, biblical and the Bible, but now you're struggling with lust. Tell me how that impacted either your marriage, uh, the relationship with your son, and then your next son that came. How did that impact you? Yeah, there was, um, you know, at 25 years old, I was singing, I was performing a lot, and there was a lot of women throwing themselves at me, and I really couldn't control myself. And um, I ended up cheating, infidelity, adultery, and um, I ended up being honest and telling the truth and ratting myself out, as my boys would say, and uh, it just ruined the relationship. Um, I'm glad I was honest about it, though. I'm glad I didn't keep it, but I, I did. I failed, and um, needed, need, I needed to address. I still need to address this lust that is running rapid in my life. And how did that impact? Your kids, how old they? How old were they when the marriage fell apart? Were they still young, or? Yeah, man, they were very young. My eldest was three or four, and my youngest was less than a year. I still feel bad about that, but yeah, that's what happened, man. I I cheated multiple times, and it just tore tore that that relationship, that family apart. I feel bad about that. The youngest, you know, the young boys, they had no idea what was going on. And, but the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So that's what happened because I didn't get my lust under control. So do you feel that the lust robbed you of the relationship with your children? Because now you don't have that family dynamic. Now you're going through a divorce. They're not going to get to spend, you know, that traditional mom, dad every day, go to sleep at night, wake up in the morning. So lust, in a sense, it robbed you of the early childhood memories with your children. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And and that lust is, is one of the tools, one of his main tools that he uses to sneak in and destroy the wholesome things that you're trying to build with your life. You're not going to win if you try to fight them alone and by yourself. And so in that, once we, once I got married, I started to walk away from the Bible and walk away from God and his power and the, and the sword, which is what the Bible says. The word of God is your sword and your righteousness is your breastplate. Well, lust doesn't fall under the umbrella of righteousness. So I was outside of righteousness. And if you're not living righteously, it's harder for God to protect you. Okay, God wants to protect us. But, he wants, but the only way he can really protect us is if we live righteously under his covenant. And that's why he gave us these, these statutes. Thou shalt not kill, steal, commit fornication or adultery. It's not because he's just trying to be a stern, strict father. He's trying to give us the pathway to righteousness and the pathway closer to him. So... Now you're going through a divorce and now your sons are being raised in a two parent house, uh, you know, one parent, you know, mama in this house, you in this house. Tell me about the relationship with the kids now growing up. Okay. It was really tough. It was really tough. And I, I went through many different girlfriends during that time. And then after about, well, wait, I, okay, let me ask you a question because this is when you went through these different girlfriends. Yeah. Did you allow the girlfriends to meet your sons? Yes. Okay. Looking back on it now, was that a positive or a negative? Because this is something that couples that are no longer together constantly bicker and fight about, is making sure that they don't expose their children to whoever they're dating until they found the right one. So 
tell me about that because that right there is a teaching moment. Yeah, yeah. I looking back, I probably yeah. should not have done that. And one of my girlfriends told me that. And I was like, nah, that's cool. <laughs> but still just arrogant and prideful. These are things that are not fruits of the spirit. So my ego was blazing, getting the best of me, thinking that it was all good. I'll figure it out. I'll make it work. Very arrogant. And I didn't realize that until recently. Recently? Until recently. Wow. Like last year. Okay. I thought I was a humble guy. Not so. Wow. Not so. Extremely arrogant, extremely haughty. Which is, and the word, the Bible uses that word haughty a lot. We don't use that much now in, in our English language, but it's the perfect word because living in America, living in California, there's, um, there's, a, there's extreme arrogance and pride that comes with just trying to survive out here, that bravado that you, you feel like you have to have, that false confidence you feel like you have to have just to survive. You become, it becomes a part of you. It becomes a, how you identify. And um, that's not Christ-like. So let me ask you a question. Um, did your children inherit any of your bad qualities? So I'll, one example, lust. All so they, they inherit that because they saw their father with other women, you know, and so forth. And then because typically our children mimic the behavior of our parents. So was that something you had to deal with? My sons, I could say my eldest son, cause he's 19. My 16 year old, not yet, but yeah, you know, they're, they're sponges, they absorb. So my son has absorbed arrogance, pride, ego, lust, anger, which I still have a problem with. And um, arrogance, pride, ego, lust, anger, and abuse. I was very abusive in my first marriage. And emotionally, um, thinking that I was doing the right thing. So yeah, my, my eldest son has inherited all of those qualities, unfortunately. And um, yeah, I was very critical and very judgmental. And I just knew, I just knew that I knew it all. And if everyone just followed me, everything would be all right. But I wasn't following Christ. So it was like the blind leading the blind. So did you know, when did you figure out that they were following your footsteps? Or is it only in the last year that you had this revelation? Did you think everything was okay? And then you had these epiphany like, oh, I realize. When did you know uh, for your children? About three years ago when my son started smoking weed and putting it online. And, um, you know, I, I smoked a lot of weed, but I never put it online. That was like, enough. that was like, <laughs> why would you do that? Um, and so that was the, the breaking point between me and him because he was already on probation, okay? on probation for lustful activity. Couldn't control his lust like his father, got the best of him. And um, so if you're, so if he's already on probation, now you smoke a weed putting it online, I was like, that's not cool. I want to have a conversation with him. He didn't want to talk to me. So I said, okay, well, I'm gonna send this video to your probation officer. Wow. Yeah. So let me get this straight. You sent the video of your son to the probation officer, probably with the right intentions, or was it ego? Because that right there. Well, for me, I thought that was going to get him to stop. And I felt like, okay, because I was already outside of the house, right? So I'm like, as a father, what can I do? I can't just, I guess I could have, but I wouldn't have felt like a father if I just let him do it and not do anything about it. You won't talk to me about it. I guess I felt helpless. This is my only play. This is my only play. So I, I made that play. But he said, if you do this, if you do this, you're never going to see me again. And I haven't seen him since. Really? 
Yeah. yeah. I don't regret it <clears throat> because you got to take a stand. And that was my stand. And do you envision a time in the future that you can bring the relationship 360? Well, with God, anything's possible. And I do envision myself hugging my son again. But there's got to be love and respect coming from him as well, because he's very disrespectful. And um, I don't know if he's ever going to be able to soften his heart, but that's my prayer. When I pray for my sons, I pray that God will soften his, soften his heart and um, teach him about forgiveness. And if that, if that ever happens, then I would love to, um, you know, have my sons back in my life. And so in order to do that, I'm healing myself. Because it wasn't me that blocked them. They blocked me. You know, my first son blocked me because I gave the probation officer the video. My second son blocked me because I didn't send him money. But there was already pain and resentment there. He probably just used that as a reason to just cut ties. Whatever it is, I am uh, willing to take all the blame. Not all the blame, but my side of the blame, right? There's two parents. I'm willing to take it, take it on the chin, take the L, you know, call it what you want. I'll accept it. But at the same time, now that I'm in this position, all I can do is work on myself and heal what hasn't been whole emotionally. And, and my principles and my morals and my character. And one of them is self-respect. I'm learning how to demand self-respect. Okay, so let me, I'm going to take you back to a, a, a powerful memory with your sons. And then I'm going to touch on what you just said, because th this is, um, this is powerful here. We're going to dive into, but tell me a powerful emotional memory with the oldest son. Anywhere growing up in childhood, tell me about a memory that you think about that just brings joy to you, happiness. A time with the oldest son. Mm. Tell me about that memory. And then also tell me a memory about your youngest son and a, a moment, a time, an experience where you just felt just unconditional love and joy. I guess when I used to take him to the park and we used to play football. Mm. So we used to take the football to the park and I would make my youngest son cover my eldest son. So my eldest son would be the wide receiver. My youngest son would be the cornerback. And I would just be throwing the ball. Okay, run the post, run the flag, run the fly. And that was probably the most fun that I've ever had. Wow. Is playing with my sons at Shabaran Park. Wide open field, beautiful field, sun shining. Boys are smiling. I'm throwing the football. What could be better than that? Mm -hmm. And now my youngest son is a hell of a ball player playing football and starting both ways you know and i can't even go see him play now why can't because, you see him go play because i'm at, at a point now where i've been threatened both me and my wife our lives have been threatened by my son and he is a part of gang activity And I don't trust it. He's already said, next time I see you, it's on site. Mm -hmm. Could be idle threats. But at this point in my life, I have a family to protect and I'm not willing to risk that. So is there a Switzerland in the family? Is there someone that can start to broker that peace between father and son? Is there an uncle that they respect or the mother or someone that you have a connection with, with that person and they also have a connection that could start to broker? I thought there was, but that person turned into, turned out to be a wolf in sheep's clothing. As the Bible says, there's a scripture that preaches to that. Be careful of false prophets. So, 
the first step was acceptance of what you did. Acceptance, hallelujah. And then the second was healing. So you're in that phase of yeah. healing right now. Yeah, that's where I am. And so yeah, yeah. now when do you think you're going to be done? Because I think in order to rekindle the relationship with your children, there's four layers. There's acceptance, and then there's um, accepting that, you know, what you did, toxicity, et cetera. Yes. And then there's forgiving yourself. Yes, I'm still working on that too. Okay, so you're in forgiveness, and then there's going to yeah. come out to reaching out to them, and then the healing process. So what is the forgiving, this second layer of the journey? Because there's, I like to believe that there's four layers to this journey. So you're in, in the second phase of it. Okay. What does you forgiving yourself look like to you? I know uh, the Bible is a big part of it and the Word, but what else, what other tools are you putting in place to start to forgive yourself and heal yourself? Yeah, just learning how to release expectation okay. and just understanding that I know I did the best I could with what I had. It's what I had. I wasn't whole going into it. And we all make mistakes. And the difference between a hero and a villain is how you respond to that pain. So some would say that I'm still working on forgiving my father for not being there for me and not giving me those tools, not being a man because he wasn't a man. I didn't know what a man was. I'm freestyling the whole every day, just freestyling. Um, so I feel like I have forgiven him, but that's debatable. Okay. So I want to fast forward into the future. You've now healed yourself and you've forgiven yourself and you've now finished the second layer of your journey. Now the third part is reaching out and starting the process of healing that relationship with your children. What does that look like to you? Tell me what the steps look like to you. And even though, like I said, we can't predict what happens in the future. Right. We have no control over it. But in a perfect world, how can you envision starting the process of reconnecting the dots and asking for their forgiveness? Well, I've already asked for their forgiveness. Okay. Okay. I've already apologized multiple times. To the point where my eldest son says, stop apologizing. What are you apologizing for? And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm apologizing for this and this and this and this. He's like, just stop. So I said, okay, I'm going to stop. I'm not apologizing anymore. You know why? Because we all make mistakes. And I'm your father. I didn't beat you. I didn't beat your... Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, I made mistakes, but I wasn't the most terrible father. And everyone knows I did the best I could. You know what I mean? So at, the, at, at some point, you got to stop apologizing. And I've, I've made it to that point. So uh, what does forgiving me myself look like? I feel like I'm on that road. And that just comes with releasing the stories, releasing these stories and these identities, identifying with your past self. Because the truth is... The moment is all we have. Okay. You can hang on to the past if you want to. Or you can let it go. I like that. I've decided to let it go. You know, the one thing I will share with you is, you know, I didn't talk to my daughter for it was like five or six years. And um, mine, you know, I'm not um, ashamed to admit that it was ego. It was ego and pain that kept me from, you know, and, and I, I've let this be known that I even say, yeah, you're dead to me. Like, you know, I don't, I don't want to know anything that's going on. And, you know, through her mom, I would hear like little things, what's going on in her life, but I just, you know, dismissed it. But when we started the, finally started the healing process, the one thing that she did say to me that resonated was, I wish you wouldn't have stopped trying. Even though I pushed you away, even though I wanted nothing to do with you, I hated you and I wished you did. I just wish you would have kept trying. And um, 
I just felt called to share that with you because I know things are a little more um, delicate with, with the relationship right now um, yeah. with your sons and so forth and just because of the activities. But, um, you know, just know that deep down inside, they're, they're wounded children. Yeah. And you're still their father. And no matter how much hate and animosity, you know, deep down inside, they really don't want you to give up. Now, how that looks like, I, I don't know. That's for you to decide. But I would just say, definitely sit with that in, in meditation or when you're when you're reading the word, and just know that although our children push us away, they really want us to fight for them. Yeah, you know. So I still send emails to them to this day. Oh, you know, because okay. the phone's blocked, Instagram's blocked. So now I'm sending emails. Nice. Happy birthday, son. <laughs> like little things like that. Um, you know, child support ain't stopped. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Dental bills ain't stopped. Mm -hmm. So somebody's paying for that. But I'm reaching out via email and I'm not getting any responses. But um, I'm still I'm still willing to to continue reaching out. Um, but I'm also. OK, with with having no expectation. I love that. I yeah. love that. Because God is on the throne. You know, I, I believe our lives are orchestrated. And some of these things are a part of our journey. Mm. And I want to be content and humble. And however God sees fit, I want to be a part of that story. I don't want to try to force anything. I've done that for 43 years of my life. It doesn't work. No, no it doesn't. <laughs> don't do that. Wait on God. Isaiah says, those that wait on God will mount up like wings, will mount up their wings like eagles. I'm waiting on God. I'm praying, I'm meditating, I'm reading the word. And like I said, I'm healing myself so that when it does happen, I don't come at them like spiteful. Mm. Okay. Because I do, I have <laughs> done therapy and I have spoken to my therapist about this and she said, when they do come around, make sure you don't say, I told you so. And I, and I got to work on that, you know, and I, because I, I don't want to be that guy. I want to just be clean slate, open arms, like the prodigal son. You know the story of the prodigal son? No. Well, there was two sons. Rich man had two sons. The eldest said, give me my money now. I want to go live my life. Give me my inheritance now. I want to go live my life. He went, lived his life, spent it all, ended up. Poor, broke, came back to the father. Father opened his arms, said, give my son the fattest lamb and, and the best robes. And then the youngest son said, Pops, I've been here all this time. Why didn't you give me this? And, and the father said, I thought my son was dead and now he's alive. So let's all party. Let's all be festive. So the father didn't harbor any ill, ill content toward his son for doing that. You know, I want to be like that. You know, but that son came back with the word of the day, which is humility. humility, humility. We don't talk about it enough in this culture. Okay. Humility is looked down upon because Instagram, look at me, look what I got. Humility is not the word that, that it should be. It should have a lot more esteem behind it. So I want to approach the relationship with humility. I want my sons to approach the relationship with humility and respect. And I believe that's where the healing can begin. How's your relationship with their mom? Non, non, non-existent. Okay. Yeah. Okay. How long has that been? Uh, maybe half a year. Okay. I had to block her. I had to block her. She was extremely disrespectful and just hurtful toward me and my wife. And I just had to put a stop to it to protect my, my marriage. Okay. Boundaries. Right? I had to put up these boundaries, yo. And it's something that I'm still learning. But I got to protect my marriage first and foremost. So tell me about that. So congratulations. You're newly married. Thank you. And um, so now you're navigating through these um, new waters as a, as a new family. And yeah. then you're bringing, I don't want to say baggage, but there's just a lot that you're bringing with you to yeah. the new relationship. And 
you're having to decipher through and, and figure out how to maneuver because I'm sure this can cause tension with your current wife. Luggage, man. I came in with luggage, yo. And um, I got to give my wife props for putting up with it because there's a lot of negativity that comes from not just those souls, but also my family. And my wife is a very strong woman. Probably, probably, okay, not probably. My wife is the strongest woman I've ever experienced. Stronger than my mama. And my mama was the strongest. Now she's number two. Okay. So my wife is the strongest woman that I've ever experienced in life. And I'm, I'm really proud of her for standing up against all of these negative arrows that have been coming after us. And it started with the ex-wife and the sons saying things about her, saying things about us, but it also has permeated throughout my family saying negative things. So that's why I've, I've been almost confrontational. Adversarial is a better word because um, I'm not gonna let, I'm not gonna let the enemy steal, kill and destroy this beautiful marriage that God brought into my life. Mm. Because it's this marriage that brought me back to God. Wow. I'm not letting anyone tear us apart. Oh, that's beautiful. As we start to wrap up this podcast, which has been a beautiful podcast, and I really love the fact that you really shared a lot of the word with us and just how you correlated it with different situations as you were growing up and just um, your life. Any final thoughts you'd like to share with fathers out there that may be in the same situation and maybe things that you would have done differently that maybe might have just produced a little bit different outcome? I would have, I would have waited. I wouldn't have rushed into it. But if you're already in it, then I say spend as much time with God as possible. Because now every morning I wake up and before I look at my phone, I pick up the Bible and I get a scripture and I read it and then I meditate for 30 minutes. And then I start my day. So now I put God first. And I feel like if we do that more often, then in those times of tension, instead of going the anger route or the emotionally abusive route, the spirit of God will be closer to us and will, will, will remind us. Like recently, I've just been learning to not react. <laughs> That's like the mm -hmm. secret. Just don't react. You don't have to say anything. There's peace there. God said, be still and know that I am God. There's peace and stillness and silence. That's where God is. I like to say that the voice of God is silence. That's when he's able to speak to you in silence. So not reacting is the hack, fellas. Mm. It's the life hack. Don't react. Mm. Because now it's our ego trying to force our idea of whatever's going on in this circumstance and trying to regulate it and manipulate it in the way that we see it with our finite mind and probably filled with ego and arrogance, just don't react. And let the silence create peace so that God can fill the room. Remember this person that you're dealing with is someone that you love very much that gets blinded in the, mid, in the midst of the tension and everything. But you really love this person, be it your wife, be it your girlfriend, be it your sons, be it your daughters. You really love this person. But then if we react out of ego and pain, you can't take that back. You can't take it back. Don't react. Wow. Thank you for those powerful words. Now, in closing, I would love if you would grace us with maybe a little acapella of your music or something you've been doing this a very, very long time. And I would love for you to share with the audience just your gift that God has given you, your voice. Well, you know, man, I, um, I sang Amazing Grace at my father's funeral. 
And it was something that he passed away four years ago. It was something that just came to my heart on the way to the funeral. So, so you weren't going to sing. I wasn't going to sing at okay. all. He did a lot of resentment, a lot of hurt, all that stuff. It was just the last thing on my mind. But I did it. And now I have that portrait up on my wall, the, the music of Amazing Grace, because that song, Amazing Grace, is about humility, realizing that you are flawed, but God's grace is what holds you together. Because remember, God's grace is not about our actions. God, we It's free. It's a gift. All we got to do is receive it. So do you think Amazing Grace was closure with your father? I think so. And I think it goes, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that rains. A wretch like me, I once was blind, but now I see, was blind, but now I see. Wow, beautiful words. Thank, Thank you. you so much for being here today. This has been a pleasure and just so insightful. And that's a wrap for fatherhood, breaking the toxic cycle as we start to help fathers heal their relationships with the children one person at a time. Amen.